Let's see, Mr. Leininger. This condition you mentioned is like a clunk in the transmission when you shift from neutral to reverse? Yeah, Mike. I notice it each morning when I back out of the garage and again when I start to go forward. It's not so bad after I've driven a while, but later on when I start for home from the office, I notice it again. Besides that, the car seems to creep more at times than at others when I'm waiting for a light to change. I see. It's more of a cold operating condition. Once the car warms up, it's not so noticeable, right? Yes, come to think of it, it's like you say. I'd feel better if you took a look at the car. Be glad to, Mr. Leininger. I've had a mechanic standing by since you called 15 minutes ago. Mr. Leininger wants us to check a little harsh shifting in the transmission, Don. It shows up when shifting from neutral to reverse or to drive. The car also tends to creep too much until it warms up. But that's only normal, isn't it? Well, some slight noise and a tendency to creep is normal. In this case, however, it might be too severe. So we'd better check into it and make sure it's up to standard. Then it's not too serious, eh? Ordinarily, no. Too high a fast idle setting will exaggerate the condition. It's usually caused by a lack of synchronization between engine and transmission speeds when the car is cold. As you probably know, the engine automatically runs faster when it's cold. That's so it won't stall. And when the transmission's in neutral and the engine's running, some of the transmission parts are rotating, too. When you shift from neutral to reverse or drive, you suddenly stop those parts from rotating. That sudden stop is what you notice. What's more, the gear ratio in reverse is greater than it is in the forward speeds. So the condition is more noticeable in reverse. I see, Mike. It's just a quick stop of fast-turning parts. Right. And as the engine warms up and drops to normal idle speed, the condition is less noticeable because the transmission parts are not turning as fast. And Mr. Leininger's car could have too high a fast idle setting, huh? That could be the case, Don. Besides that possibility, the kickdown or reverse bands might be improperly adjusted. They could be grabbing instead of engaging smoothly. Say, you don't suppose the transmission's been damaged? No, it's not very likely, Mr. Leininger. The fluid in the torque converter pretty well absorbs the shock of stopping the fast-turning parts. Okay, Mike, you and Don do what you can. Give me a call at the office and let me know. I was listening in on you and Mr. Leininger, Mike. You handled it well and explained a condition all owners ought to know about. Thanks, Tech. Now I want to explain the correction to Don. Good idea. Let's bring Don up to date on power flight service in general. I'm ready when you are, fellas. Where are we going to start? You check the fluid level first. This is usually checked every thousand miles, but always begin there when you're checking a transmission condition. But remember, you have to do more than see where the level is on the oil level indicator. That's the part you probably call the dipstick. Tech's right, Don. Let's review that level check. Apply the parking brake. Then start the engine. During engine idle, move the selector through all four positions, holding it a few seconds at each position. Bring the selector back to neutral. Now, with the engine idling, check the oil level indicator. If the transmission fluid is fairly cold and level is below the low mark, add enough to bring it up to low. Why not to the full mark? The fluid expands almost a full quart when it warms up. So bring the level up to full only when the fluid is warm and the level is low. And that takes about 10 miles of driving. Good advice, Mike. In fact, we ought to let the gas station people know, too. Then they'll check fluid level when the engine idles. We've got a guard against overfilling the unit. Right. When the unit's too full, fluid will spill out of the filler tube. Now, once the level's right, you can check engine normal and fast idle settings. And don't forget the danger of too low an idle setting. Yeah, Tech, if idle speed's too slow, the engine will stall when driving or shifting. You'll also have a rough idling engine. I'll watch it, Mike. The right idle setting is vital. Unless you get it within limits, transmission operation will be affected. Yeah, Don, so don't guess at that setting. Always use a tachometer, and be sure to set the tack properly before you use it. You're so right, Tech. Some mechanics use the tack without checking the correct cam lobe setting. Set it for six lobe when working on six cylinder engines and use eight lobe when you work on the eight. You'll get wrong readings if you don't. Okay, 
I'll set that tack right. Fine, now hook it up. Put the selector in neutral, start the engine, and warm it up to normal operating temperature. Set the parking brake, and then loosen the throttle linkage. Adjust idle at 475 to 500 RPM. Then reset the throttle linkage. Remember to reset this linkage every time you make a change in idle speed adjustment. Got that? Yep. Turn off the ignition. How about explaining that new way of checking fast idle when the engine's hot, Mike? Good idea, Tech. Fast idle speed is just as important as normal idle. So, with the carburetor air cleaner removed, open the throttle valves by hand, wide open. Then, let them come back to about half throttle position. Now, hold the choke valve closed and slowly close the throttle valves. That will place the cam in the fast idle position. Now, without opening the throttle valves, let the choke valve open. Then, restart the engine. It should fast idle at 2100 RPM, plus or minus 50, with the engine hot and the transmission in neutral. Uh-oh, this job's running too fast. That means you'll have to bend the choke connector rod to get the fast idle within specifications. Yeah, turn off the ignition, Don. Then open the throttle valves until the cam falls off fast idle position, which returns the carburetor to normal idle speed. Use this tool to bend the connector rod at its lower angle. Then we'll repeat the test and see if our fast idle's been slowed down. All right. Hey, she's fast idling just under 2100. Good. Now let her slow down to normal idle, and then move the selector into reverse and into drive a few times. If you don't notice a condition that's objectionable, you've finished the correction. But we'd better road test the car and make sure that the normal upshift is all right. And I think that Mr. Leininger is going to be mighty pleased, Mike. And there's just a normal amount of creep, too. We know his normal upshift is smooth, so the band operation is okay. If upshift was rough after we'd made these adjustments, we'd have to check hydraulic pressures and the kick-down band adjustment and direct clutch operation. Speaking about smooth upshift, why not talk about some of the more common upshift conditions? Not a bad idea, Tech. I had something in mind along that line. For instance, suppose an owner reported a harsh upshift during normal driving. Why, a throttle linkage adjustment would fix that, wouldn't it? It might, Don, but there are other possible causes. However, correct throttle linkage adjustment is important to keep the upshift pattern in the range of 15 to 18 miles an hour during light throttle. Right, Tech. The wrong throttle linkage adjustment is only one possible cause of a harsh upshift. There might be improper line pressure or improper throttle pressure. In addition, there's improper kickdown band adjustment or improper direct clutch action. Guess I popped off too soon. But wouldn't we still check the linkage first? Yes, because throttle linkage controls upshift speed. And you check it when the engine's up to operating temperature. So once the engine's warmed up, look the linkage over. Look for bent parts and for possible interference. Move the transmission throttle lever. See if it returns freely to its stop. If not, correct the cause of the interference. Make sure the engine's idling at 475 to 500 RPM with the selector in neutral. Loosen the clamp nut on the throttle control rod. Slide the rear part of the rod rearwards to take up the slack. Then tighten the clamp nut. Now somebody better turn this record over. Then we'll cover what comes after making the linkage adjustment. After adjusting throttle linkage, Don, road test the car to see if it upshifts smoothly. Okay. If it wasn't smooth, we'd check hydraulic pressures next, right? Yes, sir, and checking pressures is a must. Check line pressure first, because that's where the hydraulic system begins. If line pressure is wrong, throttle and governor pressures will be wrong. Before checking those pressures, Mike, maybe we ought to brush up on what happens inside the transmission. You've got something there, Tech. Don, or any mechanic, would realize the importance of linkage adjustment and proper pressures 
if he knew how they affect parts and valves inside the unit. Well, knowing that inside story won't hurt me, that's for sure. Okay, then. You know, of course, that when the car starts moving with the transmission in drive, the kickdown band is applied and the direct clutch is released. Yeah, that provides the low gear ratio needed for acceleration from standstill, right? Right. Once the car gets rolling, a higher gear ratio is needed for cruising operation. So a shift has to take place in the transmission to change from breakaway to a cruising gear ratio. That shift changes the kickdown band from an applied to a released position. At the same time, the direct clutch goes from a released to an applied position. All of this takes place hydraulically by means of a shift valve. So let's look at this valve. By applying hydraulic pressures to the ends, this valve can be shifted from one side of its chamber to the other. And when that valve moves in its chamber, it opens up or closes off hydraulic passages, which allows pressure to apply or release the kickdown band and direct clutch. Right. Here's an example. To shift the transmission from breakaway to upshift position, the shift valve has to move from its present position to the other end of its chamber. This movement is controlled by throttle pressure at one end and governor pressure at the other. Equal force is being applied to each end of the valve now. So the shift valve is held in its present position. Now, governor pressure gets stronger as car speed increases. So when car speed gets high enough, the force applied to the governor end gets stronger than the force applied at the throttle end. When that takes place, the shift valve moves to the upshift position. That movement opens a passage and allows line pressure to be applied to the offside of the kickdown servo. This releases the kickdown band. At the same time, line pressure also goes to the direct clutch, causing it to be applied. In other words, the upshift is completed. The kickdown band has been released and the direct clutch has been applied. Still with me? Yeah, Mike. I realize why checking pressure is important now, if these operations are to take place smoothly. Throttle linkage controls throttle valve position, and that's why we checked it first. Yeah. We know our linkage adjustment is right. So we check the hydraulic pressures next, right? Right. And you start with line pressure. Always check line pressure with the transmission in reverse. Why in reverse? Because in reverse, you can check maximum pressure put out by the front pump. That lets you rule out any possible difficulty in pump operation. So install this 300-pound gauge in the line pressure takeoff hole on the forward left side of the transmission. Bring the tack down where you can watch it. Now, start the engine and move the manual lever to reverse. Line pressure should be 225 to 275 pounds at 1600 RPM with the rear wheels free to turn. Our line pressure in reverse is okay. Good, now see if line pressure is 85 to 95 pounds in all other selector positions at 800 RPM. Line pressure checks out, Mike. Suppose it was too low. Then you'd have to remove the regulator valve for inspection. That procedure is in the reference book. All right, now that our line pressure is okay, do we check throttle pressure next? Yeah, so turn off the ignition and move the manual lever to neutral. Remove the throttle pressure takeoff plug on the right side of the transmission and connect a 100-pound gauge hose to the hole. Start the engine. Since the engine's idling and the manual lever is in neutral, the gauge won't show any pressure. That I know. What's next? Well, from underneath the car, move the manual lever one detent toward the front so the transmission is in drive. There should be 13 to 15 pounds on the gauge while the engine idles. But if you don't get that right off, don't get excited. Work the throttle linkage back and forth a few times to vary engine speed. Then check throttle pressure again. Okay. What if I still don't get the 13 to 15 pounds? Then you'd have to adjust the throttle valve. 
Remove the throttle valve adjusting screw plug on the left side of the transmission, just forward of the neutral starter switch. About a quart of fluid will drain out. With this wrench, engage the throttle valve lever adjusting screw through the hole. Adjust throttle pressure as you watch the gauge. A counterclockwise turn increases pressure. Clockwise reduces pressure. Shoot for 14 pounds. Shift the manual lever a couple of times between neutral and drive. Throttle pressure should return to 14 pounds when the lever is returned to drive. That all there is? No, you're not done yet. Leave the manual lever in drive. Then quickly open the throttle to wide open position once or twice. There should be a momentary reading of about 80 pounds. If not, check the throttle valve for sticking. Yeah, and when you get throttle pressure adjusted properly, reinstall the plug and torque it 20 to 25 foot-pounds. Add fluid to bring it up to proper level. Okay. Now we will have a smooth shifting transmission, eh? Yes, if the kick-down band is releasing properly, but we'll talk about that later. Right now, while you're set up to check pressures, might as well see if governor pressure is okay. You see, if the governor valve sticks, say due to dirt, the entire shift pattern will be affected. The car might upshift too late or too soon. We check governor pressure with the 100-pound gauge, don't we? Yeah, so cut off the engine. Clean the area around the governor pressure takeoff plug and remove the plug. Connect the gauge and put the manual lever in drive. On this Plymouth V8, governor pressure should be 15 pounds at a speed of 13 to 16 miles an hour. So, let's see. Okay, now you should get 45 pounds at a speed of 22 to 26 miles. If you do, governor pressures at higher speeds should be satisfactory. Pressures for the six-cylinder job and all other models are in this reference book. Swell, Tech. I'll sure look them over. But I've still got a question. Suppose I don't get the governor pressure specified. What then? Well, ordinarily, we'd remove the rear extension housing to examine the governor parts, and maybe the rear pump also. But there's a shortcut in the reference book that might save you all that work, Don. You can usually free up the governor valve by blowing filtered air into it. Good, Tech. If it's easier, I like it. Getting back to our case of harsh upshift, suppose our linkage adjustment is right and our hydraulic pressures are okay, all that's left is checking the kick-down band adjustment. Okay. I know how to do that. Fine. You'll soon learn you can correct almost all power flight conditions by using adjustments and tests available on the outside of the unit, Don. And now that more cars are equipped with power flight, you'll have to be up on all the service know-how there is. Actually, fellas, power flight maintenance is so important. I'm going to be back with more information next month. We've got to do our part to help our owners enjoy smooth, trouble-free miles of power flight performance.